Hi, everybody. Again, this is Heidi Pickman from Cameo. I'm the Associate Director. And I was just about to send out um, the notice for the next webinar. It was the beginning of August, and I came in. I was reading the news over the weekend about some fires that have now become known as some of the bigger, biggest fires that California has ever seen. And little did we know that then. Um, and I, I said, well, we can't do. I was going to do something on how do we prepare the gig economy? How do we how do we teach the gig economy? And I'm like, um, not this time. I think this time we need to um, talk about what's happening to um, our members and our small businesses. We had members in Northern California I sent emails to Superior. Um, we'll hear from them today. Um, EDFC up in Mendo and Lake County. And then the following week, we heard from we heard about fires down in Orange and San Bernardino. And I think it's no surprise to all of us on the webinar that we're living in a new normal. So, um, uh, you know, this reality is here, it's present, um, and it's up to us um, as small business service providers to be able to serve our um, our community and our small businesses. So put to, started from scratch um, and put together a great panel. It just so happened like the week before um, the Federal Reserve Bank came out with a report about how small businesses react to disaster recovery. Um, on it, we'll hear. So for, we'll hear first today from Lizzie Matuzzi. Um, she's she was one of the authors of the report. Um, we're also going to hear from Ryan Richardson up in Superior California Economic Development. They're on the ground right now, um, dealing with um, the fires in Redding. Um, then. We'll hear from Leah Abate from Women's Economic Ventures, who um, worked very closely with what happened down in um, Santa Barbara, first at the fires and then the mudslides and what happened to small businesses there. Um, and then, of course, we will hear um, exactly how to do it um, from someone who's been on the ground in all the disaster areas, helping from the U.S. Um, SBA side, is Cynthia Cowell. Um, so, but first, I want to start with a short poll um, uh, on a scale of one to five. Um, how prepared is your organization to respond to a disaster? Um, fire, earthquake, right now it's fire, it's a hot summer. Um, we'll give everybody a moment to fill that out, if you could. Take a moment and and fill it out. We only have a few responses here, so there we go. Interesting. So, um, anybody else want to register their their vote here? Great. We have more coming in. I'm going to skip to the results and. Wow, we have nobody thinks they're not at all prepared. So that means at least you're thinking about it. We have quite a few um, people who chimed in and said, mm, we're, "We're we're 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 a little prepared, but not that much." And a few who say that they are very prepared. Just a couple, 22 percent. But um, so. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if the, those are now um, some of those some of those organizations who have been there. Um, so I get, we'll hear from them um, in a little bit. Um, so with that, um, thanks for giving us a sense of how ready you feel, how ready your organization feels. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Lizzie Matuzzi. She's a senior research with the CD Community Development arm of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, and um, she is going to talk to you about what they found about small business in responding to um, disaster. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, my name is Lizzie Matuzzi, and I'm a researcher with the Community Development Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And the Community Development Department works on a variety of issues related to reducing poverty, 
and encouraging economic inclusion. I just want to note real quick that um, the contents of my presentation don't necessarily represent the views of the San Francisco Fed or the Federal Reserve System. Um, and so I'm going to talk about um, a little bit about small business disaster recovery and sort of put it in the context of overall um, disaster preparedness and climate resilience. So we have some research going on right now um, connecting climate adaptation activities to the Community Reinvestment Act. And as Heidi mentioned, we also recently put out a report with the New York, Dallas, and Richmond feds uh, about small business credit needs and just small business needs in general after disasters. So the number of presidentially declared major disasters has been increasing, and so has the economic toll. Previous research assessments um, told us that it would probably just be outdoor industries like agriculture that would be impacted, but we're seeing now very clearly that it's a cross-section of economic sectors um, that are impacted by both the shocks and stresses related to climate change. The good news, however, um, as Bloomberg recently reported, you actually save $5 in recovery spending for every $1 you spend on reducing risks and their impacts before a disaster strikes. So there, is, there are things we can do both before and after a disaster. So, Banks can actually receive Community Reinvestment Act credit for investments in a FEMA major declared disaster area. And for those of you who are not familiar, the CRA requires banks to invest in low income areas that are part of their assessment area that's based on where they do business. And the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC are the agencies that, that regulate the CRA. What's slightly less well known is that there's a component of the CRA that allows credit for investment in declared disaster areas. And the language around this in the CRA guidance is that activities that count towards CRA credit for disaster are those that revitalize or stabilize designated disaster areas. Now, revitalize or stabilize can be anything that helps attract new or retain existing businesses or also attract or retain residents in a disaster area. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be directed at low-income communities, but extra consideration is given if, if it does. Disaster recovery credit um, it can apply towards CRA um, for actions that are taken within 36 months of the date of, the date of a disaster designation. Um, in some rare cases, this has been extended. Um, and also, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a bank's assessment area. So um, assuming that a bank is already meeting the needs of low-income communities in its assessment area, it can receive CRA credit for disaster recovery activities that are sort of within their same geographic region, but outside their assessment area. So with this context in mind, um, I just wanted to present a few results from the Small Business Credit Survey report on disaster-affected firms that came out this spring. So of the small businesses that responded to the survey that were located in a disaster area, 40% reported losses related to a disaster in the previous year. So we're talking about a good chunk of small businesses. And what was interesting was that these firms were actually more likely to report revenue losses than asset losses. So the disruption to business and cash flow was greater than the cost of actual physical damage. Um, you can imagine this, this was due to power outages, other infrastructure disruption, or just a lack of customers um, immediately following a disaster. 
And as you can imagine, these revenue losses can impact everything from payroll to debt servicing to just paying the rent and keeping the lights on. We also found that there was a mismatch between the insurance that small businesses were carrying and the insurance that they needed. Um, for example, few firms had business disruption insurance to cover those revenue losses. We also found that small businesses that had the lowest credit scores and therefore you know, had the hardest time getting credit to begin with were also the least likely to hold adequate insurance at the time of a disaster to cover their losses. Um, folks were often relying on their savings or on their personal credit cards um, to manage their, their business finances um, immediately after a disaster. But the upside to this was that the, the total amount of financing that they were seeking after a disaster was, you know, relatively small. The, the largest group fell into this twenty-five to hundred thousand dollar bucket, um, and another twenty-seven percent were applying for loans under twenty-five thousand dollars. We also found that small businesses experiencing disaster-related losses were 1.5 times as likely to apply for credit as unaffected firms. So, you know, this, the context here is that, um, you know, immediately after a disaster event, it often, um, it typically takes, you know, a, a few weeks or sometimes a few months for those really important um, federal dollars to hit the ground. And this is that, that time period that's really crucial for small businesses. So when small firms were applying for loans during this time, they were actually most likely to apply to large banks, but they also were seeking financing from alternative sources, such as online lenders or other non-bank lenders, such as auto dealers, farm lenders, friends and family, nonprofit, private investors, and state and local government. And after the private business loan, the, the next most likely product they were applying for were those federal small business administration loans um, that are so critical. So I'll just quickly run through some of the ways um, from our interviews that we conducted um, for this research um, that seemed uh, like really key to supporting small businesses after a disaster. So just returning to this idea that there is this, this funding gap between when a disaster occurs and when those FEMA and SBA dollars start flowing. Owners need financing to fill that gap. Um, and we found that in different parts of the country, public, private, and nonprofit partnerships were really key to filling that gap um, in terms of creating avenues for small, bri small bridge loans. Um, an example in California, as you're probably already aware, is the California Infrastructure Bank partners with small local banks to provide uh, post-disaster or small business loans. And it's also important to have a plan for how to reach businesses after a disaster and help them prepare for the next disaster you know, whether they were impacted or not, but particularly while it's, it's fresh in people's minds. And this, this includes ensuring that businesses are adequately insured and figuring out how you're going to fund risk mitigation. Um, a really important thing is, you know, digitizing records because when those get destroyed in a disaster, like a fire or a flood, that can really, you know, hold up businesses moving on. Um, you know, whatever the local context is, if it's, you know, moving your utilities out of the basement, if it's buying a generator, there's a lot of things that looking at your local context can help with. And then just tying it back to this connection with the Community Reinvestment Act, um, one important thing that um, is often overlooked is that Disaster-related uh, investments 
are automatically considered to be eligible for CRA credit if they are consistent with a local disaster recovery plan. And there's really a lot of flexibility about what, what that means, what kind of local disaster recovery plan in the CRA guidance. And again, just returning to this idea that preparedness is always less expensive than recovery. And so, you know, just getting folks thinking about investing in low-income areas, um, you know, where there hasn't been a disaster yet, um, and thinking about that in terms of CRA credit and helping with climate adaptation. And so I'll just um, uh, cue up the idea that um, we have a report coming out this fall about connecting climate adaptation to CRA credit. Um, and we also have a Q&A on our website um, right now about climate adaptation in general. Um, and of course, the, the report that I uh, was sharing about small business credit and disaster recovery, um, there's a blog post on our website and it's also on the New York Fed Sports website and I'm sure Heidi can share that. So um, thank you that. and if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to try and answer them for you. Yeah, I just have one question. So this, this I, I, and I didn't even think about this before. But so, for example, see, a bank could get CRA credit for giving a micro lender some loan funds to do quick loan if they can't lend it out, but to do some quick, uh, do a you know some quick loan, make some quick loans to small businesses. Is that is that sort of what you're thinking? And also pre-disaster, I'm guessing, like you said, with the retrofit. Yeah, so there's, there's, and of, of course, you know, I can't say exactly what will get approved, but there's, there's, you know, a couple of, of buckets to think about it in here. There's, you know, thinking about a bank's assessment area and targeting low-income populations there that is totally unconnected to a disaster but could help with um, preparation. Um, and then there's looking at this little niche of post-disaster credit um, that can be but doesn't necessarily have to be tied as directly to low-income communities as normal CRA credit. Got it. Um, great. Does anybody have any questions? And we, we're happy to send out a copy of the report in the, um, in the, after, after the webinar. Does anybody have any questions for Elizabeth? Type them into the um, chat box. If not, um, I am going to. So that was that was sort of the data. You know, um, I thought that was really interesting. Revenue losses is is, is really what's what's at stake here. Not as much as out. It, it's the losses are much greater than asset losses. Um, so that has some implications for some of our services. Um, that, and so that's the data part of it, of what we've seen. Now we're going to hear from Ryan uh, Richardson, who's from Superior, California. He's on the ground um, in in Reading and working with small businesses. His community has been effective. And Ryan's going to kind of give us um, a little picture of what's going on and how Superior is working um, working with um, their small businesses right now um, in the short run, in the immediate run. So, Brian? Well, thank you, Heidi. I appreciate it. As Heidi said, my name is Ryan Richardson. I'm the Loan Program Manager for Superior California Economic Development. We're a four-county economic development district based in uh, rural Northern California. Our headquarters is in Redding. Um, all of our staff lives in Redding. And on the loan side, I, we have a revolving loan fund, and we're also active in SBA 504 lending. The car fire broke out on July 23rd, and it, um, it came into Reading on July 26th. So this is a little bit different for us. We're, we're used to having forest fires this time of year, but there's a lot of forest around us, and, and we're used to seeing that, where this change is actually, it, it came into town, um, and it burned. Uh, we've lost 1,077 homes to this uh, fire. It's burned over 200,000 acres. Basically, that's the size of New York City. And if you um, drive from one end in Reading up to the other end of the fire, um, 
in Lewiston, it takes you about 45 minutes to drive, and that just gives you a little bit of the size of this. Um, it's also only 71% contained, and where the Hertz fire, just outside a little north of us on Shasta Lake, is burning right now. So it's a little smoky in the area, and, and we're doing all this while recovering um, with our business owners. A little bit of a timeline or background how, how this came to be is pretty interesting. Back in July, uh, Cameo had their um, uh, annual me um, member meeting, and I specifically went uh, back to listen to the disaster prep. Uh, I was very interested in that. EDA has been pushing towards that. We're an economic development district, so it's something that, that I've been on in the periphery. And I had excellent takeaways from uh, Ben, and someone was there, Leah spoke, uh, Mark Quinn, and Olanda. So it was a great bunch of information. I took lots of notes thinking, hey, we need to get on this because every year somewhere in the area burns. But it's usually a smaller rural community, um, so we need to be ready to help those people in our district. A couple of, I'm sorry, I was, got my notes mixed up. That was actually the meeting member was in June. But the fire rips through Reading on July 26th. And, and that was a tough time for so many of us. We were evacuated, uh, displaced. There's a sense of helplessness as you're sitting there watching the firefighters go by, do their job, and you're just, there's nothing you can do. Um, luckily, the playbook was already been written by Ben and Leah and their organizations. And I knew it was very important to get funds to small business owners as soon as possible. So even while I was evacuated, I'm texting a coworker about repurposing one of our uh, loan funds for the businesses impacted by the fire. And this was super important because it gave me something to do. It made me feel like I was helping. That's one of the strange things. If you haven't been impacted by something like this before, you, it's such a helpless feeling and you want to do something, but you're not always sure. So this was Thursday. Friday goes through the weekend where they were able to hold the line pretty well. Um, not a lot of homes were burnt after that. So Monday I go back to work and the first call I made was to, to Ben who was one of the speakers at the Cameo meeting and he was very gracious with his time and sent over things that he thought was helpful. And I talked to Leah for a long time and she was very helpful as well, very open with information. Uh, talked to them, um, kind of started developing our blueprint for what we were going to do within our organization. The next call I made was to our um, to the SBA, to the Sacramento District offices, offering whatever assistance we could do for them. Um, we off we offered office space, offered to be able to drive somebody around if they needed to come up. Anything we needed to do with the preliminary reviews, we were able to help. Uh, another thing that we did right away was checking on our evacuated coworkers who were not at work. But there's only six of us in the organization. Three of us were evacuated. I was able to go back to work on Monday. The other two didn't come back for a few more days. So I was just checking on them, making sure they understood that we cared. Um, Leah put me in touch with Devin, and she gave me some specifics uh, about things that they had done at Weave, which I, I was very appreciative for. And Heidi at Cameo was so nice and followed up and said, is there anything we can do? And she put us in touch with Mark Quinn, um, who's on loan from the SBA to Cameo. And he was uh, super helpful going over the process and what we could expect and what we needed to do as part of that. So some of the things we've done as an organization, we started a business recovery loan program. Uh, we were making $5,000 loans, 6% interest, no payments for the first two months, no fees. Um, you know, they asked, why do we have an interest rate? Why aren't they grants? Well, we were able to read, this is what I was able to do. We were able to repurpose one of our loan funds, drop the interest rate quite a bit. And so they kept the monthly payment low at 225. That's a two year loan. And, the interest that they pay is a nominal $363. So the important part was getting the cash out there so they could cover um, cover those the, those immediate expenses. Rent still is there. The the um, a lot of service businesses we've talked to. Um, we made our first loan within a week of the fire. And so far, we've made four. So it, it's not a huge demand yet, but we were there for the people that needed it right away. We're also um, housing the SBA Business Recovery Center. They'll be there at our office to the end of the month. We developed a financing info matrix that has local, state, and federal information on it. Ben suggested doing that and very appreciative. 
we've committed, we've done a lot of outreach to lenders, uh, business people, our borrowers, other nonprofits, um, and working with our city and county contacts. And then the economic development district, we, we know a lot of different people. So we've reached out to say, oh, we're also helping out. Don't forget about the small business owners as part of this, the home-based businesses, the people that didn't have physical damage because it's very rare that they had physical damage to business in this fire, but it was a lot of economic impact because uh, the west side of Reading shut down for approximately you know, three or four days. And then probably the most important thing that I see is doing is that we've developed a position. It's called the Business Recovery Specialist, and, and I, I jumped on this idea. Uh, Leah and Devin did it at their organization. I saw the immediate value of providing this, this position, and we started last week working with different, um, looking for sponsorships for different corporations and foundations in our area to fund this, and it'll be an outreach person, and Leah's going to go over a little bit more in depth. But that's something that we we're working on this week, and hopefully we'll have some good news to roll out next week about that program and get the person up and running. A couple of observations that I've seen, you know, that we're starting to finally breathe again. You know, for the first two weeks, it was running on pure adrenaline, and now we're able to, to go back and kind of look at things. And it's interesting how, how the disaster playbook is being formulated. We've all look, looked back and saw how Ben did in Sonoma and Napa County. We looked back and saw how Leah did it in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. And so we all are, are calling these people. And the same thing with our city governments. They contacted the same cities. And so we asked, what worked for you guys? So it's interesting to see that this playbook is coming around. Another observation, each area impacted by the disaster is different. I mean, Reading is much, uh, much more rural and poorer than the other two areas that, that we saw. But we also have a mega church in the area. So it's interesting to see how um, different communities react differently and who steps up here versus who steps there. One of the most um, jarring things that I saw was even within Reading, which is only 100,000 people, People who live on the west side were extremely affected. You know, we had a lot of friends and neighbors who lost homes. People on the eastern side of, of the river didn't have the same um, level of impactness. They saw them in the news, but they, it wasn't as – it was just a different thing. And so they had a different outlook on it, and, and it took them a little bit longer to realize how bad everything was on our side of town. Um, from a self-care point of view, I think Leah talks about this as well, you know, you're going to be doing two jobs here for a while. We all have our normal job, um, and then I, all of a sudden I started doing my normal job, plus a lot of fire-related activities, trying to set up this loan program, trying to set up the, the funding for the business uh, recovery specialist, going through the jobs description for that. Um, so it, it gets a little bit, it can wear you out. Um, I like to say that the outpouring support has been overwhelming. Uh, personally, I like to thank Cameo, uh, Heidi for putting us in touch with people, Mark Quinn for being on the calls, Leah, Ben, Devin, everyone I've talked to has been so nice and so helpful with their time. Um, just want to let you know that it's super important to me that if you have any questions or anything that um, you want to know in detail about what we've done, feel free to give me a call. Um, or email. I definitely want to be a resource for other people. It's just part of paying it forward for what everyone has done for us in our community. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, and I'm going to I'm actually on the way to a soccer tournament with a couple of my, my players. So I'm going to have to drop off the call um, so there won't be many questions, but I will be available via email or phone at my office, and Heidi can provide that information. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. That gives us a real interesting perspective on the ground, and I'm so glad that um, uh, you know what we do here in Cameo is useful for people. So that it it, it really um, is satisfying for me because we sit back here looking, you know, we're far away and we're looking, um, you know, have that sense of helplessness, and it's like, yeah, what can we do? So um, thanks for reminding me that that's something that's a that's something that we do. Um, um, so um, I want to bring into the conversation now Leah Bate. She was a former WBC director and disaster recovery project manager at Women's Economic Ventures in Santa Barbara. Um, uh, 
and Leah's, um, the, you know, Leah's almost 10 months um, away from the disaster and has sort of a, can kind of give us a more longer term view and um, on on what happens to small businesses over time and how, you know, some of the things to put in place for recovery. So, Leah, welcome. Great. Thanks so much, Heidi um, and Cameo, for asking me to be part of this and also for your support as we were going through the disasters. It was really helpful. So I'm glad to be able to share, you know, our experiences and lessons learned for um, current, you know, people experiencing it currently or in the future. Um, so just a little quickly a reminder of kind of what we faced, as Ryan said, every disaster is different and unique. Um, December 4th of last year was when the Thomas Fire broke out in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. At the time, it became the largest in California. It's now, you know, the Mendocino Complex Fire, I believe. Um, so the fire broke out early December, and then um, on January 9th, we had a huge storm that resulted in the debris flow that caused um, 23 deaths and more homes destroyed or damaged. It also closed the 101 freeway for a couple of weeks between Santa Barbara and Ventura. So in total, businesses were really impacted for about six weeks. It was really prolonged. And three of those were during the holiday season when they typically make 40 to 50% of their annual sales, particularly for retail and hospitality businesses. They maybe had 5 to 10% of sales compared to previous years. You know, tourists and locals just were not leaving their homes or they just weren't in the area any longer, you know, trying to escape the air quality ash and evacuations. So it was about a six month, or excuse me, six weeks um, disruption in, in time of um, recovery and disaster. And then just to give you an idea, Lizzie mentioned it, but it was about six weeks until um, the individual assistance was declared from the federal level. Um, that opens up the federal programs such as disaster unemployment insurance, the low interest loans from the SBA, local resource centers opening up. But there was that gap um, between when the fire started and when the federal assistance came. Um, and even then, you know, the, the help is not immediate. Um, it might take time to apply for the SBA loan, et cetera. So looking at um, what our clients needed, um, they, of course, needed emotional support. You know, first, after making sure they were safe and well, we tried to be, you know, a helpful ear to them, um, provide emotional support, and really make appropriate referrals to mental health um, practitioners or agencies. Um, they definitely needed an infusion of capital, as was mentioned before. Many businesses still paid their employees, even if they were closed and had not one sale, um, which was really commendable. Um, but they needed that infusion of quick capital to pay their bills and the regular expenses because they didn't have the reserve that they were supposed to from the holiday sales. In terms of information and resources, you know, clients needed to know, first of all, what resources were available to them, and then second of all, how to actually navigate applying for them. Um, so we had to, you know, at a time when they were shell-shocked, lost, unsure, you know, overwhelmed, grief-stricken, uncertain, evacuation still happening. So we had to quickly educate ourselves on what those resources looked like and how we could help clients um, navigate them. And we'd heard from the SBA folks that were incredibly helpful, and we, they were one of the first connections that we made once they came to the area. We'd heard that, it, you know, many clients don't actually take action for maybe four to six months because they don't feel the effects immediately or they think they can manage on their own and bootstrap. So we knew that we needed to have, you know, a cute, really quick um, response, but it was also a really long-term effort that we needed to be prepared for. So what our response included, um, similar to what Ryan had mentioned, um, we needed to create a new product called the Quick Response Loan to provide that quick infusion of capital. You know, we saw and heard the effects of, um, to small businesses really within a couple of weeks of the fire breaking out. And not knowing when or even if individual assistance could be declared, we knew we needed to offer an option immediately to help clients. So we rolled out the Quick Response Loan on January 1st. In my next slide, I'll um, speak more specifically to what that looked like. And as Ryan mentioned, you know, we, two neighboring counties were impacted um, for the disaster, and they were affected very differently. 
Um, so we needed to take stock of how we would be involved in each and where there was overlap. So we joined as many groups and attended as many meetings related to disaster recovery as possible. And where there weren't groups or meetings, we tried to be that connector and convene the stakeholders. Um, this really helped us to allow us to advocate for small businesses because sometimes the focus was on personal loss, which of course is equally important. But in order for businesses to not be forgotten or overlooked, we needed to be that voice for them. It also allowed us to be just a resource to clients and better understanding what was out there um, and just more trusted in the community. And through some of these meetings, we realized the importance of you know, providing tangible numbers and metrics, similar, you know, just like the study that Lizzie talked about, um, we wanted to be able to provide data about our, the disaster in our area, both for to seek local funding or uh, you know, outside of our area funding. So a few organizations actually collaborated with a UCSB researcher to put out a survey across three neighboring counties to see and measure the impact. And everything that I've talked about here, you know, this is above and beyond our normal responsibilities programs and grants for funders, like Brian mentioned. So um, it was important to add both short and long-term capacity. So in the short term, we was lucky in that um, we were able to kind of shift my role um, to be the project manager and organize communication and outreach um, efforts because going above and beyond what we already had, it was too much really to put on all of the staff um, and so we were probably lucky and fortunate in that way and I think it was helpful to just have a dedicated staff person to be kind of the point person for everything. We also quickly sought funding for added long-term capacity and for us that meant adding several positions, um, a communications staff, a program assistant, and the business recovery specialist that Ryan mentioned. Um, the business recovery specialist was really helping to triage and evaluate client needs, direct them to the appropriate services either within Weave or with the SBA um, or other agencies. And um, our uh, resource specialist has been able to help many clients through the SBA economic injury loan process or even through Weave's own quick response um, loan process as well as provide the really helpful TA that they needed to recover. So coming back to the quick response loan, um, we opted up to a $10,000 loan, um, both because it helped, it limited the risk to our portfolio and because 10,000 is our internal approval limit before it needs to go to a committee for a higher amount. So that was the amount we could approve internally. Um, we opted for a 4% interest rate, you know, 18 month term, a very simplified loan application process and documents required. Um, that'll be sent out in the post webinar email. We waived application fees, um, provided interest only payments for those first three months, and really committed to getting a decision back to the borrower within 24 hours of a completed application. Of course, getting to a completed application often took days, if not a few weeks. Um, but once they submitted it, we wanted to get back to them with a decision very quickly because that um, was a, an important part of um, the equation. So we're seven months into offering the quick response loan, and I can share a little bit about what we learned. So it was really important to disperse money quickly, as has been mentioned, but we realize now in hindsight it might have been better to offer two options. So the 18 months at 4% broke down to $35 a month for three months for the interest only payments, but then it jumped to over 600, which may have been just too much for some of the borrowers, um, especially those that were existing borrowers and now had two loans. Um, so the, a different option may have been to offer a 36 month term at a standard interest rate, which would have made um, a little bit more manageable, I think for some, because we're looking at probably having to restructure some of the loans. Also, in order to get the loans out quickly, we needed to restructure the responsibilities of the loan staff. Um, there were three loan staff at the time, and the way that we had been doing things wasn't exactly going to work to get things out quickly, so we just had to re-divvy up responsibilities. So think about that if you're looking at offering a product that goes out quickly, um, do you need to restructure the staff responsibilities temporarily? And we uncovered that um, a lot of clients really had some pre-existing you know, issues in their business that were just simply exacerbated by the disasters. So 
it was more important, you know, than ever to be able to refer them to our other programs within the Women's Business Center, like consulting programs, business courses, et cetera. And to give you an idea of the volume that we experienced, um, we, I think at, we're at 22 loans um, presently. More than half of those are from brand new clients to weave. Um, and we've typically funds 25 to 30 loans a year, um, and currently we're at 28, inclusive of those QRL loans. So um, quite a lot more than, than normal. A bit more about what we learned in general. Um, you know, obviously, it's really important in the prevention stage to help businesses with that disaster plan. Um, one of my proudest moments is that one of the business planning clients went back and created a new business plan for the disaster because it could very well happen again in our area. Um, but also for practitioners, thinking about how can you, can your staff operate remotely and efficiently? Our offices were in evacuation areas, you know, as Ryan had mentioned, our staff wasn't comfortable or safe in coming to work. So which of them or how could we operate remotely? Thankfully, our, fire, our files had been stored in the cloud, things like that, because they could have been damaged, had any um, physical property damage happened. So be thinking about, you know, how can your organization operate remotely if needed? We were reminded of the importance of maintaining those community partners. Um, we actually reached out early on to the local SBDC and just said, hey, let's offer the same product, the quick response loan, the same interest rate, same terms, because we knew we needed to get the money out the door quickly, regardless of who it came from or from any competition. And we had been working on a good relationship with them, so it made it easier to just connect and get that ball rolling. Also, you know, always important to identify those trusted community members that in, in the micro communities that you serve that can help bring together their constituents and groups and help disseminate information because the flow of information and needs to go quickly, you needed to know it yesterday in these, in these times. So identifying those people beforehand um, to really help quickly disseminate information is great. And then a reminder, too, that um, federal resources um, aren't available to those clients you might have that are undocumented. So there may be private uh, groups and funds that pop up. Um, there's undocu funds both in Sonoma County and Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. But just be mindful of that. Be mindful of your messaging and of the accessibility of your centers, depending on you know, the clients that you're trying to reach. And then a little bit more on, you know, the additional funding capacity we sought. Um, we were really clear with our funders, these are the four things we think we need to be able to serve the community appropriately. The business recovery specialist is a really key position. That job description will be included in the post-webinar email for you. Um, we needed more communications marketing staff to help outreach, a program assistant for administrative, you know, purposes and scheduling, um, and then also having banks contribute to our loan loss reserve because we really aren't, you know, are still not entirely sure how the quick response loans um, will repay. So that was an important thing that um, bank, thankfully bankers and our funders did step up for all of these positions. And thinking about, you know, what was most effective for us in terms of outreach, you know, one-on-one -on -one outreach and consulting really was most effective. It is the most labor intensive, but it will have the highest, you know, return or help for our clients. Um, our business recovery specialist held office hours actually at our disaster recovery center that popped up after the local assistance centers closed. She saw a steady stream of new clients to weave and was able to really get good face time with other agencies. Um, and in terms of the SBA disaster loans, which we'll hear about in a minute, um, she learned that you know, many people might be declined on their first attempt, but if they persisted and really worked with the SBA, SBA has been really helpful in working with clients and getting them to an approval. Um, she also completed a request for authorization form with the SBA so that she could speak to the disaster recovery team on behalf of our clients, which is really helpful to you know, move things forward, help them uh, explain financials, work on paperwork, things like that. And I wanted to just last share this um, disaster recovery phases graph that uh, was shared with me, but not until June. Um, so I wish I'd seen it sooner in the middle of the disaster. But I think it's rung true for community members and colleagues that after the disaster, there's this, you know, 
community comes together. There's just so much collaboration. There's so many stories of heroism, um, and it feels really good to be part of that. But after, you know, as you take inventory um, or as, as the trigger events might happen, you know, additional evacuations, another disaster pops up, um, things that trigger that trauma to kind of resurface, sometimes it gets a little worse before it gets better. And I, and I don't mean to be negative. I just kind of want to paint the picture. Um, but it is a long-term recovery um, and reconstruction effort, but it does get better. Um, and as Ryan mentioned, self-care is a really important piece got to put your oxygen mask on first before you can help others. So the emotional and physical toll that it takes on practitioners, make sure that you're taking care of yourself so that you can show up for the community as they need it. And finally, here are a few emails. Um, feel free to email any of us, the loan team, our business recovery specialists. Um, and then again, some of the processes, the documents for the quick response loans and the business recovery specialists. Uh, job description will be included in the post webinar email. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Leah. Um, yeah, it sounds like you, it, I love how everybody is kind of working together and learning from each other and, and going in community. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to speak too I'm not going to speak. I'm going to move right on to Cynthia Crowley. I'm in the USDA Office of Disaster Assistance. I'm just going to turn it right over to you, Cynthia. And um, I think you might run a few minutes late. Just want to set expectations for people, so take it away. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Cowell, and I'm a public information officer for the Small Business Administration Office of Disaster Assistance. <clears throat> I'm assigned to Field Operations Center West, which means we respond to disasters anywhere from the Mississippi River to Guam and further. We respond to any kind of disaster, be it natural or man-made, and uh, we have some disaster preparedness tips for you. Just to reiterate what everybody else has been saying, up to 25% of all businesses that close after a disaster never reopen. And a lot of that is because they're unfamiliar with the help that's out there. Um, and we, we all have to think about it with businesses. What if your business had to close down for several days after a disaster? How would you stay open? We recommend that everybody have a plan to stay in operation. If your business is cut off either by fire, flood, any sort of thing like that, and assess the internal and external functions of your company to determine, to determine what you need to stay open. We ask that people or businesses keep extra supplies of hard to replace items. Um, and it's best to keep it at an off-site location even if you have a small business that's run out of your home, if you have your parents around and you can keep things at their house, someplace where you can have quick access to your supplies, uh, such as uh, printer cartridges or gas for your, for your generator, uh, that you have quick access to all that. Do you have enough insurance? I know Ryan talked about that a little bit. And make sure you review your policy. It's best to do it every year um, or more often just to make sure that you know what is covered and what isn't covered. And it's always a good idea to have business interruption insurance. There it says, consider business interruption insurance. And it does help you with, with uh, operating expenses. And business and direct insurance can also compensate you for lost income. And do you have flood insurance? Most insurance policies don't cover flood damage. So you need to make sure you check with floodsmart.gov or you can ask your insurance carrier. Quite often they will say, oh, you don't need flood insurance because we're not in a flood zone. If you're not in a flood zone, it's actually easier to get flood insurance, and it's much cheaper. So I would look into that if I were you. And the, after a disaster, your insurance company needs to have accurate documentation of your business assets. And 
photograph or videotape your facility and its contents, and then every time you get a new piece of equipment, photograph that and keep your receipts so that you have backup to show what this cost. And arrange for off-site backup and storage of vital records and information. You can store it to the cloud. There are companies that will do it for you. And you need to, comp to completely back up your computer data regularly and routinely. A lot of businesses will say, well, I'll do it next week. I'm too busy. i got to go. And that's when their, when their business has a fire or something. You, your backup only goes, far as, goes back as far as you, your backup, your most recent backup. And two weeks of, of uh, your, your information can be very hard to recreate when it comes time to do that. You need to communicate your post-disaster recovery strategy, especially among your key employees. You need to assign certain people to be responsible for certain things, but also be mindful of the fact that they may have had disaster in their own home, so you need to make sure that you have a good communications plan. Develop a list of your important phone numbers and email addresses for everyone that you deal with and keep it updated regularly. And you should have these contact lists kept by a key employee. And it's good, a good idea to designate an out-of-region contact. That could be um, your parents if it's a small business, or it could be one of your branch offices if it's a larger business. And the message center would be used, would use phone and email to support crucial post-disaster communications. Head off any rumors of failure and appoint a spokesperson to inform local media, suppliers, and your customers about your operations and recovery. A lot of times you'll see signs up that say, we are still in business, and that's good, but you need to have a plan to do that. And then you can always go to disasterassistance.gov. This is the FEMA website, and it uh, consolidates information about federally funded government uh, assistance. <clears throat> there is www.preparemybusiness.org, and this is a wonderful thing. It has checklists in it where you can check off Yes, I've prepared this. Yes, this is my list of employees. And this is my insurance coverage. And you write down your policy numbers. So it's a very handy thing to have. And you can learn how to develop your disaster business plan at www.ready.gov or call them at 800-237-3239 for brochures. There are also additional resources listed here. We also work very closely with our research part, our resource partners, WEV and the Superior uh, California SBDC have been so great in last year in the fires down south and this year in the fires up north. Uh, the Superior California SBDC is hosting the SBA Business Recovery Center, and we can't thank them enough for that. It's a wonderful location. So our, our partners do include small business development centers. SCORE. SCORE is very good at helping you recreate your uh, business information, uh, bringing in uh, your, your off-site stored Things and having a uh, a uh, your your spreadsheets and all that, they can help you recreate all your your financial data. Women's business centers are constantly constantly looking for ways to help. Same with the Veterans Business Outreach Center, and they both have excellent programs available. 
so you can consult them. It's we we recognize alternatives that may mitigate the adverse financial. Consider alternative sources of revenue, and identify ways to to uh, reduce re- reduce costs of recovery. For more information, you can contact the Small Business Administration Office of Disaster Assistance. Uh, you can contact them by email at disastercustomerservice at sba.gov or you can go to www.sba.gov slash disaster, or you can call our customer service center at 800-659-2955. And uh, just briefly, the counties currently affected by the uh, fires, the, the Shasta County has been declared, and so a business in Shasta County would be eligible for the uh, physical damage loans and the deadline to apply for physical damage loans is October 3rd, so that's coming up. And then businesses in Lassen, Modoc, Plumas, Siskiyou, Tehama, and Trinity, as well as Shasta, are eligible for economic injury disaster loans, and the deadline for that is May 6th of 2019. And with that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Wow, you ran through those really quickly, uh, Cynthia. Thank you so well, much. Um, there's a lot of good information. We're, is it okay with you if we send the, the slides out so everybody can kind of pick off? There are some um, some of those um, resources that you that you have. Is that okay? Oh, that's perfect. That'd be great. Perfect. Perfect. So, um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Cynthia? Um, I mean, there's. I mean, I guess the point. One of the points in this is that, uh, first of all, people who are on the phone, on on the webinar and on the phone, um, you're obviously concerned about your communities, and that's the, that's you know the first seven. You're thinking ahead, and so I applaud you. Um, and I guess the thing to know is that there is help out there, um, and that we can point you to the right resources. And um, um, I, you know, it's great. I'm grateful to everybody else who was um, who had been working with um, you know each other to pass on lessons learned. Does um, Does anybody have any questions for anybody other than Ryan? Because he had to go. <laughs> um, why don't you unmute um, people now? The conference has been unmuted. Um, you're, everyone's unmuted, so if anybody has a question, feel free to ask. Um, yes, I joined the conference late, but I understand you'll be sending out copies to everyone that signed up via email of the different yes. um, PowerPoints. Yeah. Excellent. And you, can, and you can listen to yeah, and you can listen. And there's some lot of a lot of good information and takeaways, um, I think, on on how to respond and what to what to what to prepare for. Great. Look forward to it. Um, what else? Um, well, with that, it is 3.01. Um, I want to thank our um, panelists and our speakers, Lizzie Matuzzi, um, Ryan Richardson, Leah Abate, Leah Abate, and Cynthia Cowell um, from the USSBA. Um, thank you guys so much for doing the work that you've done and how, the work that you've done in your community and being willing to share with us. Um, I hope that next uh, month everybody, everybody comes back for Engaging with Veterans. Um, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship in the military and what you can do to get ready for Veterans Day in November. So that's why we're doing it in September, so it'll give you a little planning time. Um, Thanks, and have a great afternoon, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you.